She was more than a star. She was a seductive cocktail of glamour and damage. Could a single bottle of pills have erased her from the screen? On August 5th, 1962, at 3.50 a.m., a living legend was pronounced dead. Inside Marilyn Monroe's body was a massive overdose of sleeping pills. But no one knows how they got there. There was nothing in the stomach to indicate that she had swallowed anything poisonous. Did this American icon die by her own hand or by that of another? They had a number of hours to reconstruct the death scene and put together the suicide scenario. Now, it's time to reopen the case to recreate Marilyn's final set. Well, I would suspect that the hand was actually more in this position from the description in the report. To simulate her lethal sedation. I'm adding the Membutal. And to smash through four decades of speculation on unsolved history. This actress is about to take part in a life and death experiment under the watchful eye of a doctor. Hi, Marika. Thanks for helping us out today. Mm -hmm. The number of pills she'll attempt to swallow represents enough toxic pharmaceuticals to kill several people. We have the 25 yellow ones, which are the same size, shape, and color as the Nembutal tablets. And we have five tablets that are the same size, shape, and color as the chloral hydrate tablets that she would have had. We're about to recreate the death of the 20th century's greatest movie star, minute by minute. Okay, here we go. Pill by pill. In an attempt to discover precisely what happened on a hot August night in 1962. Wow. One minute and five seconds that mm -hmm. it took to do all that. When Marilyn Monroe's life and career were cut painfully short. Was her death a suicide? an accidental overdose, or the result of a murder plot. The official cause of death was acute barbiturate poisoning due to ingestion of overdose. But besides the levels of drugs found in her blood and liver, and the pill bottles found at the scene, there was no clear evidence that Marilyn had actually swallowed the pills. What drama played out within the walls of this Brentwood bedroom? One, no question, Marilyn Monroe did not commit suicide. Two, that she was a victim of a homicide. That she was murdered. Monroe's alleged amorous links to both John and Bobby Kennedy have turned into fact for a cottage industry of writers and documentary filmmakers in which Marilyn learns information that the Kennedys, or people protecting them, could not trust her to keep. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Her threats to tell the world what she knew led to a desperate attempt to silence her, no matter what the cost. There is a second theory did a woman who had attempted suicide before finally succeed in taking her own life? She then goes out the night before her death and fills a prescription for 25 tablets of the Nembutal when she had plenty of other medications that she could have used to make herself fall asleep. The third theory is no less tragic. Did Monroe take too many pills by mistake? Monroe liked the feeling of being um, under the influence of the sleeping pills. She, it gave her a woomy, toomy feeling that she liked. But it's the rumors of government conspiracy and foul play that have kept interest in Monroe's death alive for over 40 years, driven by stories like this. A window that was supposed to have been broken to gain access to the body in Marilyn's locked bedroom had, according to some, been broken from the inside. 
There were a number of witnesses that said that the glass was found all on the outside of the house, not on the inside, which would indicate that the window was broken from the inside rather than the outside. But Marilyn Monroe's legacy demands fact, not theory. Unsolved history will attempt to seek out those facts. We'll reconstruct Marilyn Monroe's bedroom exactly and turn it into a forensic laboratory. Is that one there? Is that to help us apply the tools of 21st century science to this cold case is crime scene investigator Stephen Staggs and forensic psychiatrist Dr. John Chamberlain. We'll recreate Marilyn's internal organs in a pharmaceutical laboratory to find out precisely how the drugs killed her. With pharmacologist Nicholas Cozy, we bring back two members of the 1962 investigative team. Psychiatrist Dr. Robert Littman and a man who was there when the controversial autopsy was performed. A former assistant district attorney who believes Monroe's death was no accident. John Minor. Our investigation begins with the official version of events, a story that we can translate into a timeline. What follows is a dramatization of the key moments described by eyewitnesses that were recorded in the official police report. August 4th, a sweltering summer day in Los Angeles. A hot wind blows off the desert, a Santa Ana wind, it's the last time Marilyn will feel it on her face. Around 5 p.m., Marilyn Monroe psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, leaves the actress's home after another session to treat her depression. 7 p.m., Marilyn's housekeeper, Eunice Murray, overhears her taking a call from the son of her ex-husband, Joe DiMaggio. Marilyn sounds upbeat. Sometime between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m., Marilyn receives another call, this time from President Kennedy's brother-in-law, Peter Lawford. He invites her over for dinner, but Marilyn sounds incoherent and declines. August 5th, just after midnight, Mrs. Murray wakes up and sees a light under Marilyn's bedroom door. She knocks, but gets no response. 3.30 a.m., Mrs. Murray calls Dr. Greenson on the second line. She still can't rouse Monroe. She uses a barbed fireplace poker to pull aside the curtain behind a barred window and becomes sure something is very wrong. 3.40 a.m., Dr. Greenson arrives and finding the door locked, uses the barbed poker to break a window, smashing glass into the room. The position of this broken glass will become a crucial investigative point. He finds Marilyn motionless, her hand clutching a telephone receiver. About 3.50 a.m., Monroe's physician, Dr. Engelberg, arrives and pronounces his patient dead. The police aren't notified for another 35 minutes. When LAPD Sergeant Jack Clemens arrives at the scene, he finds a dozen or more pill bottles on Monroe's bedside table. One of them, a prescription for 25 capsules of a barbiturate called Nembutal, filled on August 3rd, is empty. One week later, tests on Marilyn's blood and liver show huge levels of Nembutal, enough to kill at least three people. This was the official story the world learned. A depressed Monroe had committed suicide. The coroner estimated she had taken up to 50 Nembutal pills. But questions soon emerged. Why did the medical examiner find no residue of the pills in her stomach? Why did the doctors not call the police until 425, when they found the body over half an hour earlier? And why was this bedroom not declared a crime scene and scoured for evidence? In historical investigation, as in real estate, location is everything. But the Brentwood bungalow where Marilyn died has been extensively remodeled since 1962. So unsolved history had to go back to the original plans, to 
to recreate it virtually. Conspiracy expert Donald Wolf knows this house back to front. He spent years researching Marilyn's death. So this is the room in which Marilyn was found? Yes, her body was found here on the bed by Dr. Greenson and Eunice Murray, the housekeeper. I know Sergeant Clements, when he first arrived on the scene, he immediately suspected that something was wrong, and he said he knew right away that her body had, the scene of her death had been changed. In fact, some unusual activity drew Officer Clemens to the other end of the house. This room is the laundry room, and Sergeant Clements said that uh, he had been in the bedroom asking questions of Dr. Greenson, Dr. Engelberg, and Mrs. Murray had disappeared, and he tried to find her in the house, found her back here doing the laundry, and he thought that was rather odd that here her boss had just died and she was in here uh, doing the laundry, which was rather peculiar. Right next to the laundry room was Marilyn's guest room, the focal point of the most celebrated conspiracy theory of all. I believe this is the room where Marilyn actually died. Right here? Yes. Wolf believes that an ambulance crew had been at the house much earlier in the evening, trying to resuscitate Marilyn. They were going to take her, uh, put her on the gurney and take her to the hospital. He mm. thought she was well enough for that, but Greenson interrupted the process, and then uh, when she started succumbing, he attempted to give her uh, an adrenaline injection into the heart to revive her, but the needle hit a rib and she died at that moment. And that was at about 10.30 Saturday night. A former ambulance driver first told this story 20 years after Marilyn's death. No one has ever provided a single piece of concrete evidence to support it. But its implication that Marilyn was murdered is so serious that it demands thorough investigation. Now, Unsolved History is about to put the conspiracy theories to the test, using not rumor, but physical evidence. We'll attempt to separate the possible from the impossible and tell the true story of Marilyn Monroe's last night. Surrounding Marilyn Monroe's last hours are as hard to define as the allure that made her a star. In death, Monroe still captivates us as she did in life. But the scarcity of evidence is shocking. All that remains in Monroe's case can be contained in one file. And originals of key photographs of her bedroom have been lost, leaving only these grainy mimeograph versions. This lack of concrete evidence helps breed speculation of conspiracy and murder. But for Unsolved History, this file is full of clues. On the morning of August 5th, medical examiner Dr. Thomas Noguchi performed the autopsy under the watchful eyes of Assistant District Attorney John Minor. That autopsy report still exists. And we used it to bring John Minor back in time to see our careful recreation of the state of Marilyn Monroe's corpse exactly as he witnessed it four decades ago. As assistant DA, Minor observed thousands of autopsies. This is what he saw at 10.30 a.m. on August 5th, 1962. We saw that liver mortis, that is discoloration, had occurred in the facial area. And that tells us that she probably died in a face-down position. When Marilyn's heart stopped beating, blood would begin to settle and coagulate, in whichever part of her body was lower. Since this liver mortis was most apparent on her chest and on the right side of her face, she must have died face down, with her head turned to the left. The examiner's first task was to look for signs of trauma, but beyond a couple of old surgical scars, there was no sign of violence. Minor remembers vividly what they did next, and it cast grave doubt on the leading murder theory. We checked her completely every square millimeter of the body with magnification, 
and there was no needle mark in her body. The ambulance driver's story that Marilyn's death was caused by a needle doesn't fit with what Noguchi and Miner found. But if Marilyn had ingested a large number of sleeping pills, it would be natural to expect to find some residue of them in her stomach. The first abdominal organ that Dr. Noguchi examined was the stomach. He removed it, opened it up, and found about 20 cc's, three tablespoons of a brown liquid substance. They found no pills in the liquid, but might the liquid itself contain microscopic traces of drugs? Dr. Noguchi performed that test, and it was negative. There was nothing in the stomach to indicate that she had swallowed anything that was poisonous or the cause of death. These findings argue against her having swallowed a large number of pills. But when the toxicologist analyzed her liver and blood, he found a large dose of the sedative chloral hydrate and a massive overdose of nebutal, a powerful barbiturate. Why then was no drug residue found in the stomach? Further toxicology lab work should have provided the answer to that and should have resolved the cause of Monroe's death beyond a doubt. But something went wrong with normal procedure at the coroner's office. Those specimens disappeared. There were no microscopics, no toxicology done on any part of the organs of Miss Monroe except the liver and blood. Forty years on, this is a source of frustration to minor. In a forensic autopsy, we must do everything that can be done to tell us how death was caused, and without doing all of the tests, that cannot be established. Sorry. There you go. There's, your, there's the alarm bell. <laughs> Investigating Monroe's death is presenting unsolved history with a series of challenges. We can't analyze her tissue samples. Records of phone calls in and out of her house that night aren't available. And the death scene was never properly documented. There was no declaration of a crime scene. There was no preservation of all of the evidence within the residence. This was some kind of almost criminal suppression of an investigation. But what about the evidence that was found? What clues can we uncover 40 years on? <laughs> Using the remaining photos of her bedroom on August 5th, Unsolved History is recreating Marilyn's death scene as it was found by the LAPD. Uh, we'll start with the bed, which will go against that wall over there. We'll study it under the guidance of modern-day crime scene investigator Stephen Staggs. And on top one of the... So that all looks good. Based on the photographs, uh, her body was positioned uh, as we see it now. Staggs immediately spots the body must have been moved. I believe that the body had been repositioned before the police arrived. Mm -hmm. As an example, uh, the autopsy report revealed there was more lividity in the right cheek than the left. That would indicate that the head was actually in a position like this. Okay. Marilyn's doctors said she had died with a phone in her hand. Something else missing from the police photographs. The phone would have been on the floor with the receiver in her hand. However, the position of her hand here uh, does not make sense. Her hand probably was more in a position like this with the receiver here. And then there, the sheets were not covering her when she was found. Well, that paints a much different story than this photograph. Yes. And the fact that her hand is on the phone, what's that tell you? It may indicate uh, if it in fact was a suicide that uh, she was making some sort of call for help or to talk to somebody at that moment. Unsolved history has recreated the position in which Marilyn actually died. 
But there are more clues in this bedroom. First, witnesses said that the door had been locked from the inside. The picture shows from the crime scene that this was a solid core door, a pretty heavy door, right. and a heavy locking mechanism also. In addition to the doorknobs, we have a deadbolt, thumb latch on the inside, keyway on the outside. If this, in fact, is closed and locked, it would pose a problem for someone trying to enter the room. Housekeeper Eunice Murray and psychiatrist Dr. Greenson could not have easily broken down the door. And this supports the version of events where Monroe locks herself in the room before committing suicide. In this version, Greenson is forced to break in through the bedroom window with the barbed fireplace poker. But conspiracists claim glass was found outside the room, suggesting that, as part of staging the suicide scene, the bedroom window was broken from the inside out. But was it? The key is where the glass fell, inside or outside the window. Steve, this is a reproduction of the window outside Marilyn's bedroom. I'm going to take a poker and punch through this glass, and we're going to see which way it falls. Okay. As the barbed poker is pulled back, it causes glass to fall outside the window. Glass outside is not a clear sign that the window was hit from the inside. Another blow to conspiracy theorists. Now, to look inside the room. Well, look at this quite a bit. It looks about two-thirds of it went inside. Thanks to one of the grainy bedroom photos, we can faintly make out something never noted in the police report. Glass did indeed fall into Marilyn's bedroom. And in this photograph, we see that there is glass on the floor inside below the window. Well, then there's nothing really suspicious about the way the glass fell. No. Unsolved history has shown there's no compelling reason to doubt witness statements that Marilyn was found dead in her locked bedroom. The broken window was most likely smashed from the outside. The autopsy report also cast doubt on the ambulance driver's injection story. No needle marks were found on the body, and the pattern of blood settling suggests Marilyn died face down, not on her back. But there's still a compelling mystery to solve. If Marilyn Monroe died from ingesting 40 or more Nebutal capsules, why was no remnant of them found in her stomach? Could this be a sign of foul play? We're about to use modern toxicology to find out whether Marilyn committed suicide, accidentally overdosed, or was murdered. It's getting late. Hand me my slip. When Marilyn Monroe died, she was just 36 years old. But her movie career was already on the slide. She was living in a sparsely furnished, middle-class home. Hardly the person you would expect at the center of a high-level conspiracy, involving figures like U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. In fact, Unsolved History has already discounted murder by injection. But the fact that no traces of pills were found in her stomach has fostered speculation that this death was not suicide. Could the toxic payload found in her system have been delivered in another manner? Twenty years after he attended the original autopsy, LA assistant DA John Minor had a sudden realization. Dr. Noguchi performed a Y incision. Perhaps he saw no pills because Marilyn did not actually swallow any. Opening the remainder of the digestive system, nothing was significant until we got to the descending colon. And that portion of the descending colon, called the sigmoid colon, was discolored a deep purple. This fact was noted in the autopsy, but Minor now remembers a new detail, that the lower colon was empty. And it was the very unusual, there was no intestinal content in the lower colon. 
but that indicated to me the probability that the barbiturate that killed Miss Monroe was administered to her by an enema. If Miner's memory is correct, then conspiracy theorists are provided with another murderous scenario. And, unlike the injection theory, it seems to fit the evidence. In this scenario, sometime on the evening of August 4th, Marilyn takes enough chloral hydrate capsules to knock her out cold. While she sleeps deeply, someone prepares a solution of the Nembutal capsules and administers a deadly barbiturate enema to Monroe. Is this far-fetched scenario really more likely than suicide? There is one major problem with the suicide theory. If Monroe did swallow a lethal quantity of Nembutal, why did the autopsy surgeon not find traces of the capsules or the drug in her stomach? To find out, Unsolved history must explore the toxic timeline of Marilyn's death. We asked Dr. Nicholas Cozy, a pharmacologist at the Brody School of Medicine, to set up an unusual experiment. We've set up this apparatus to simulate Marilyn Monroe's stomach and the blood supply in her body. Cozy is about to administer a deadly dose of Nembutal to Marilyn Monroe's digestive system scientifically reconstructed in laboratory glassware. First, we need to find out exactly how many Nebutal capsules Marilyn ingested. The coroner reported that Marilyn may have taken 40 or 50 Nebutals, but that amount does not square with the known concentration of pentobarbital in her blood. Using the figures from the autopsy, and the benefit of modern toxicological science, Cozy can now calculate the actual dose. Not 50 capsules, but 24. A number that the facts of the case corroborate. It is known that she filled a prescription for 25 100 milligram Nebutals the day before. This is entirely in line with the amount that she had available to her, and it squares with the amount in her body. So how long would it take for 24 Nembutal pills to dissolve in Monroe's stomach? First, we must replicate human stomach acid, complete with digestive enzymes, and warm it to body temperature. In the following carefully calibrated experiment, the contents of this upper vessel are agitated, mimicking the action of a real stomach and will slowly empty into the lower vessel. This represents the natural rate at which drugs move into the bloodstream. At 10 minute intervals, Dr. Cozy will take artificial blood tests to see how fast Monroe's levels of barbiturate would rise. We want to get an idea of how long it takes for the barbiturate level in the blood to reach a level that would be lethal. And this will give us a rough idea of that. Unsolved history tracked down the same yellow gelatin capsules that Monroe swallowed. If the capsules don't dissolve before the barbiturate reaches a lethal level, then conspiracy theorists will have a powerful argument that Marilyn was murdered. I'm adding the Nembutal. If they do dissolve, then the autopsy findings are not at odds with Monroe having swallowed the Nembutal. Two minutes in, this is how Marilyn's stomach would look. Most of the capsules have started to dissolve. There are no intact capsules left at this point. It's only been about two minutes. At this point, a quick visual inspection of the lower chamber shows there is no significant amount of barbiturate in her bloodstream. It's incredible how quickly these capsules have dissolved. It's been less than three minutes and are almost entirely dissolved at this point. Just 10 minutes in, not a single capsule fragment remains. Would Marilyn still be conscious at this point? This represents the 10 minute sample. Cozy has calibrated this orange dye so it will turn pink when the amount of drug in our artificial Marilyn's blood is high enough to render her unconscious. At 10 minutes, there's no detectable change. In fact, it's 20 minutes before she would pass out. Unsolved history has shown that all the pills would have dissolved 
before Marilyn was even asleep, let alone dead. And even though our artificial stomach fluid has turned yellow from the dissolved gelatin, the natural action of the stomach is to drain constantly. In just 20 or 30 minutes, Monroe's stomach would be almost empty. It's not surprising at all that no capsule residue was found in her stomach or intestines. Once these capsules have dissolved, the drug and gelatin will be absorbed and essentially disappear. You know, if there was something in her intestine, the, uh, the presence of bile would have obscured any uh, potential yellow color. So this is entirely a red herring. Thanks to the work of Dr. Cozy, we've exploded the central myth of the Monroe murder hypothesis. Our experiment also explains the lack of barbiturate crystals in the stomach juice smear test. It's not surprising that there weren't any refractile crystals because the pentobarbital is absorbed so quickly and the capsules disintegrate so quickly that within 30 minutes the pentobarbital and the capsules would have been gone from her stomach. In fact, the autopsy contains one important finding that corroborates Marilyn having swallowed a large number of capsules. Her stomach lining was severely bloodshot. The report mentioned the presence of small uh, pinpoint hemorrhages in her stomach mucosa. And this is consistent with uh, irritation caused by a high dose of pentobarbital actually on the stomach lining itself. If Marilyn did take the entire bottle of 25 Nembutols, the drug would have kicked in within about 20 minutes. Maybe an hour after that, uh, she went into a state of respiratory depression. She stopped breathing. Eventually, her heart stopped beating, and she, and she died. But is this the way the silver screen's greatest star faded out? We've proven that Monroe could have swallowed the capsules. But if she did, was it deliberate suicide or accidental overdose? To answer these questions, Unsolved History has to revisit the Brentwood bungalow. There's nothing on here like posters or paintings or pictures. To enter, not Marilyn Monroe's bedroom. It doesn't look like a room someone really lives in. But her mind. When Marilyn Monroe's body lay on the coroner's slab on August 5, 1962, no sign pointed to foul play. And less than one day later, the lethal dose of barbiturates in her blood made the ultimate cause of death clear. But how did this overdose get inside her? Unsolved history has now proven that the evidence does not conflict with suicide by swallowing Nembutal capsules. But was this woman suicidal? Using the surviving photographs, Unsolved History recreated Marilyn's bedroom down to every last detail. From the pill-laden nightstand to the pile of purses on the floor and brought in a man familiar with analyzing death scenes, forensic psychiatrist, Dr. John Chamberlain. Wow. One of the things that we see that is really powerful is the lack of decoration. Nothing like a poster, picture, or anything that says, I live here. There's tapes, bags, letters, pill bottles all over the nightstand. This disarray is, in fact, a classic sign of a heavy drug user. But are there any signs of suicide? There's no note, no pile of mementos. So we don't find a shrine, we don't find a note and not having those doesn't help us very much. Most suicides don't leave either one of those, so it could still be an accident, it could still be a suicide. Aside from this pharmaceutical nightstand, there's just a single piece of evidence in this room that indicates suicide, the locked door. Now Marilyn Monroe usually slept with the door unlocked but closed. And here, on a night when she died, she chooses to lock the door. 
This is very unusual behavior, and we look for evidence of unusual behaviors when we're trying to analyze whether something was a suicide or not. By itself, the fact that she locked the door is not enough to convince unsolved history that Marilyn Monroe deliberately took her own life. It wasn't enough for the L.A. County Coroner's Office in 1962, either. A team of psychiatrists, the suicide team, was hired to investigate. Its leader was Dr. Robert Littman. That particular fact that the door was locked does suggest uh, intention to die. The main problem why I call this a probable suicide rather than straight out suicide was that in the past when she made suicide attempts, she had let people know about what she was doing. Dr. Littman discovered Monroe had tried suicide before, but this time the situation was more ambiguous. Could it be that Monroe's death was a different kind of tragedy? Accidental overdose, not suicide. Did she simply make a tragic miscalculation and take too many pills. To find out, Unsolved History asked our actress to become a test subject. She would have had at that time. First, I'm going to hand you these pills. The what if she took just a few pills, then, while waiting for the drug to kick in, forgot she took them and took a few more? Of these yellow tablets, the Nembutal, that she also took to sleep. Unsolved History is about to create a timeline for an accidental overdose and see if it fits the evidence. We're assuming that since Marilyn was using these for a prolonged period of time, that she probably had some tolerance to the sleep effects. So we're gonna say, for the sake of argument, that she doubled the dose or maybe even quadrupled it by taking four instead of one to two. With the help of our artificial stomach, we'll be able to see how the levels of barbiturate in her stomach rise. So we're gonna wait a little while to let the tissue levels of those pills rise so that they start having an effect on her. After the first dose of four Nendutals, Chamberlain judges 10 minutes must pass before she could have forgotten. She now has 800 milligrams of pentobarbital in her body, but none of it has hit her system. Chamberlain allows another 10 minutes to go by. So we're gonna have you take four more of the Nembutal tablets now. She has now taken just half the number of capsules that were found in her body. But 20 minutes after taking the first dose, those Nembutals kick in and she must fall asleep. But if she's asleep, she could not have taken the remaining 12 pills that were found in her system. Our accidental overdose could not have been accidental. The simplest explanation is that she took 24 or 25 doses of Nembutal in one episode with the intention of committing suicide. Unsolved History has made a powerful case that the conspiracy theorists are wrong, that Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. But one theory is still standing, that of bizarre murder by a barbiturate enema. When Hollywood's most famous actress closed her bedroom door sometime around 8 p.m. on August 4, 1962, was this really meant to be a final exit? The precise sequence of events during the subsequent eight hours has been the subject of four decades of speculation. But Unsolved History's investigation has dispelled much of that. We've ruled out murder by lethal injection. We've shown that Marilyn could not have accidentally overdosed. And the evidence we've gathered contradicts those who say she could not have committed suicide. But ever since 1962, Assistant District Attorney John Minor has doubted the suicide scenario. Minor's memory of the autopsy and the discoloration of Monroe's colon has led him to believe that Monroe did not swallow the Nembutal, and that the drugs got into her by another route. But there's a problem with the deadly enema theory. For Marilyn to have accepted this procedure, she must have been completely sedated, most likely with the large dose of chloral hydrate that was found in her system. 
It's very difficult to imagine that the enemas administered, the lethal dose of barbiturate is reached in her blood, and that she doesn't lose control and simply evacuate the contents of the enema. And so we'd be having to imagine in our scenario that she's being held while asleep or while struggling in such a way that she's not allowed to evacuate this enema. And remember, Monroe's body showed no sign of a struggle. I reviewed um, possibly 2,000 overdose deaths. None of them were by uh, an enema. Seems strange that this one would be by this method, nor was it customary or popular to give barbiturates by enema in the 1960s in Los Angeles. Perhaps the most important clue to understanding why Marilyn died is hidden in the contents of her nightstand. Monroe's usual sleeping pill was not Nembutal, but a much safer drug called Librium. In the month before her death, we know she took, on average, three or four Librium pills a day. We know that she had plenty of other Libriums in the house and that were still in the bottles when she was found that she could have used to help herself fall asleep and are much safer. And it really makes you question her motivation in going out and getting those additional Nembutal tablets. This suggests that her intent with taking the Nembutal was not to fall asleep, but rather to commit suicide. Perhaps the strangest thing about the death of Marilyn Monroe is this scene. The most glamorous woman in the world died alone, an addict to sleeping pills in this shabby bedroom. Here was a beautiful woman, symbol of uh, attractiveness, and she did not have a date for Saturday night. And we know that her great-grandfather committed suicide during the Depression. We know that her grandmother on her mother's side suffered from depression. We know that her own mother suffered from depression and psychosis and had to be institutionalized. Depression is known to run in families. Marilyn's suicide scene should have been no surprise. This woman had made at least three previous suicide attempts. Each time she had been rescued by calling for help. Did Marilyn attempt to make a call this time? Based on Monroe's 89 degree body temperature at autopsy, we can place the time of death sometime between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. That means she must have taken the pill sometime between 8 p.m. and 1 a.m. It's difficult to know exactly when Marilyn died, but it's entirely possible that she could have lived for an hour and a half, even two hours after taking that dose. The last person she is known to have spoken with is Peter Lawford. Lawford, who died in 1984, recalled her voice was slurred and trailed off. This call may have taken place as late as 9 p.m. If this is the case, then Peter Lawford may have heard the last farewell of a screen icon, or perhaps failed to hear a final faint cry for help. Of this, it's likely we will always be left to wonder. I speculate that she was feeling depressed and abandoned. And in that feeling of being depressed and abandoned, decided to take the pills. And in her mind, was the feeling that for sure she wouldn't be away from the feeling of loneliness and abandonment. And in her mind was the knowledge that it could kill her. And in her mind was the knowledge that she might be rescued. And in her mind was the wish that somehow her life would change. 